Hello, and welcome to the Mark Rose Podcast. If you listen to today's episode, which is the most popular episode I've ever aired, and I'm re-airing it, and that's out of 400 and something episodes, this still continues to crush and continues to be the most sought after and listened to episode I've ever done. She's actually responsible for being in the top five episodes with her three episodes, all three. And that's Sarah Baldwin. If you listen to today's episode, you will be in the top 1%, 1% of 1% of relational self-awareness. So essentially, what someone knows about themselves and how relationships work and how they work in relationship and how to navigate other people's stuff with their stuff, this is single-handedly the most important episode I've ever done. And I look forward to diving deeper with her in this subject and you diving deeper with her in these subjects because she's one of the most profound teachers. And this one, we explore attachment and attachment theory and how it works with the nervous system. It's so incomplete to just know attachment theory. And I would say it's incomplete to just know how the nervous system works. The merger of these two modalities, these two forms of knowledge is exceptional and exquisite. And you, even if you've heard this episode before, you're going to want to listen again because you're going to pick up so much more since you learned about yourself from the previous one. And if you've never listened to it, get ready to have your damn mind blown. I promise it. It's incredible. So make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification button because this is what we do is you just keep learning how to be a better human humaning in the world, relationally connected to your purpose, understanding your body, all of that stuff, being better at love. There's actually no greater predictor of your health and the satisfaction of your life than how you relate. So boom shakalaka, drop the mic, enjoy the episode, hit subscribe, makes me feel good, makes you feel good, let's change the world. All right, welcome back to the Mark Groves Podcast, Sarah Baldwin. Thanks for having me back. I'm so glad to be here with you and to all of the listeners here. Uh, glad to be with you. Well, to give people a little refresher, if you missed the last episode I did with Sarah, uh, we talked all about the nervous system. And it is easily one of my most popular episodes ever. So way to go. You apparently spoke to something that people wanted to learn. And I think what's so beautiful about understanding the nervous system is we all have one and uh, all of, they don't all function similarly. Uh, yes. But the whole goal is to get to some place where we can we can sort of, I guess, feel like uh, in the midst of conflict, we're like a monk hanging out like, oh, that's interesting that they're upset right now, <laughs> you know? Um, and we spoke about talking about, I mean, both one of our favorite things, which is attachment theory yeah. and its overlap with the nervous system, which I'm so excited to hear. This is like two things making sweet love um, and then producing a baby that is going to have good attunement with mom. Let's call it that. That sounds beautiful. That's exactly what we're going to be doing in this episode. Yeah, I I get really excited about the intersection of polyvagal theory, which is really the understanding of our autonomic nervous systems, and attachment theory, because they really are like uh, they're family members. They go hand in hand. One can't be without the other. And, and polyvagal theory is really the underpinning of attachment theory. I'm sure there's listeners here who have read a lot of the attachment books that I have on my shelf. I know you've probably read, Mark, you definitely have. Everybody's read, uh, or a lot of people have, like Attached or Diane Paul Heller's work on attachment. And um, you've listened, you know, you're probably um, versed in some way in attachment. But when we when we learn about it and, and you might say to yourself, oh, that makes so much sense. That's exactly what I do in my relationship. It's really nice to have that understanding. It's very important, actually. Mm -hmm. But have you noticed that when you actually get into a relational dynamic where let's say there's a rupture, rupture just means disconnection where our systems feel unsafe, that it what you learned in that book goes out the window. And now I'm actually having an embodied experience. So it's not that I'm wanting my system to pull towards them and feel this need and to get them close to me. My system has essentially taken over. My autonomic nervous system takes over, takes the steering wheel and says, don't worry, Sarah, I've got you. Here's what we're going to do to maintain safety. Or for others of us, where we just feel totally checked out and I just want to get in the car and drive to Montana and never look back. <laughs> 
And you're like, am I really choosing to do this? No, it feels like my body is taking over. And that's our brilliant, what I call our self-protective circuit or our Mm -hmm. autonomic nervous system saying, I've got you, I'm here for you so that we can maintain safety. Beautiful. And I was just sort of laughing with that reference to driving to Montana because I think a lot of people drove to Montana actually literally depending (laughs) on what state they were in. I know a couple of Canadians that did, that got got out. The dysregulation, they're like, fuck this noise. I'm going south. Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, so maybe to give some background and, Mm -hmm. you know, as reference, I would definitely recommend listening to the previous episode Sarah and I did. As well, we did. I did one on attachment with Sylvie Kokashian, which was really beautiful. Um, but maybe we could give a background first on attachment theory, if you could walk through that, and then on polyvagal, like the kind of need to know for yeah, this. Absolutely, and in the, in the, I think really important understanding the how they go hand in hand. You need yeah. the other um, to go together. So. Um, you know, how, how attachment theory is really how we connect or relate to other human beings. I want to just put a caveat that this is also can be how we relate to finances. It can be how we relate to our work and other things in our lives too. But today we're going to talk specifically about our relationships with other living beings and how we relate to humans in our adult lives is directly indicative of how we were related to in our earliest childhood experiences. So however I show up in my adult relationships until I have done some somatic attachment healing work is going to directly um, um, replicate how I was related to in my earliest childhood experiences. So first, I just want to say how extraordinary that is, because what's happening is our self-protective system is saying, "Uh, here's what I needed to do to make it out of that experience, to continue to maintain some kind of relative safety and belonging to get me to where I am now. And that worked because I'm here. So if it worked because I'm here, let's use that again, because we know that it works, if that makes sense to everybody. So I'm not saying that this feels good. I'm not saying that it is um, healthy or good for us, but it's functional, meaning that it works to keep us safe. So in terms of our earliest childhood experiences, for many of us, we may have had multiple people in our lives when we were young. So, so all, of, um, all of them imprint or impact our attachment, but we usually have one primary attach, uh, a, a person that we're attaching with or two. And so, you know, I think about this a lot. We learn weird stuff in school, like algebra <laughs> that I've never used, trigonometry, like weird stuff. I don't Still haven't used it. sine, cos, tan. Still. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about. So yeah. that shows you that I have no retention of what happened there. Yeah. Um, but, but we don't learn how to regulate our nervous systems. We don't learn how to be the active operator of them, which we're going to talk about in a moment. We don't learn how to be a parent. We don't learn how to heal. So people come by this well-meaning usually. Everyone's doing their best where people say, I'm going to have a kid. And they have generational trauma that's been passed down. They might not be the active operator of their nervous systems, which essentially means in control of their experience. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, they cannot create a secure attachment with us. So I'm going to first go over what happens if, let's say, you know, there's like, there's a few, there's some out there who were able to do that for us. You might be listening and be like, yeah, I'm pretty securely attached and I didn't have to try at it. Uh, That's because of this. So if we are born, when we're born, first, I just want to mention, we don't have the capacity to self-regulate. And that means that when a baby is in distress and they are crying or they need something, they can't calm themselves down. So when I think of that, I think like, wow, we are so vulnerable when we come into the world that we can't make ourselves feel better and safe. We are completely 100% reliant on the adults around us to help regulate our nervous systems. We cannot do it on our own. So, So if I have a caregiver who can securely attach, essentially what that means is they can, they can attune with me. So they can read my nervous system and they read, oh, Sarah's this little baby is in distress right now. She needs me. And so because of that, they can come in with a regulated nervous system, kind of like uh, they have a life preserver and they're saying, I can help us out of this. And then they help my nervous system to regulate. And they have to be in control of their experience to consistently do that because it means that they have to be consistently regulated. So 
If they are consistently regulated, meaning they're in control of their experience, they can attune with us, create safety, connection, belonging. As a result of that, we will more often than not um, be able to create a secure attachment in our systems, which essentially means, just in a nutshell, that we can experience closeness and that feels safe with another human being. And they also teach us that we can experience space because as we grow, we develop the ability to now self-regulate. And that means that, and, and we see this with young children as they're wanting to create boundaries, like put me down. I don't want to be held anymore. I want to walk in this room by myself. And if I have a securely attached parent, essentially what, because they feel safe in their nervous system, they are comfortable with me taking space. And so they say, that's great. You're doing great. I'm still here if you need me, but you're doing great. So they're sending the message that you are safe in the world on your own. And you're also safe with me. And as a result of that, what happens in our adult lives is that relationships are feel, filled with much more ease. And when a rupture occurs or disconnection, we know that everything's going to be okay. It doesn't mean the relationship's over. We can communicate our needs. We can have vulnerability, intimacy, sexuality, all of the yummy, wonderful things we're all wanting. Now, for a lot of folks listening, they're probably saying, I did not experience that. That's not how relationships are for me now. They are exhausting. It takes all of my mental power. I don't even know what's happening in this relationship. Like, what the hell? So if that's you, let me I'm knowingly it. laughing. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. That me was, too. Great. you know, it's like, that would have been nice. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine now? I mean, I think about that sometimes like, wow, what life could have been like if that was the way I always navigated the world. Um, and what life can be like when we come home to ourselves and home to a secure attachment that we earn, which is so beautiful and possible. For yeah. Us. It's so beautiful to think of because like, uh, it, it's so interesting, the complexity of accepting or exploring childhood things, because my parents are amazing. And so I have to humanize, like take them off this pedestal that protects me from actually experiencing that there might not have always been attunement. There might not have always been safety. And that not necessarily having to have anything to do with their character or their right. Like okay. it's just their humanness. And okay. Uh, but then I then opened the door to having to like, oh, well, shit, I got some stuff to look, excavate and look at <laughs> and and grieve. And and but now I'm at least connected to reality. And yes. I feel like on some level, humanizing them actually takes the pressure off the sort of idea of them. And I know like in exploring this stuff with my parents, communicating with them about how I felt as a kid and. And I can see like the the desire for them to protect that they did their best. Yes. And, yeah. and I'm like, no, I get that. And I just need to clear this thing or like for you to understand the impact it had upon me or whatever it might be. And uh, it's actually been pretty amazing to see at first when I first started this work, they were not mm -hmm. like, yes, let's sit down and jam on all yeah. this stuff. Uh, <laughs> But they were curious and they mm. were uh, open, which I know is not everybody's experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I've certainly heard so many heard so many parents say things like, um, well, I did my best or like I was the best. You know, I just my, you don't know this or, you know, they like get defensive uh, because they're trying to not feel shame and pain. Yeah. And like, I, hey, I did. I did my best, but it wasn't enough, right? That feeling. Uh, but man, is that ever sort of like where the juiciness of humanity is? Because now there's like everyone's pain has a place and like whatever pain made it so they couldn't show up fully is now has a seat at the table too. It's so interesting. And I, I think for you listening to just like pay attention to all those little nuances of like wanting to caretake the mom or dad from the feeling. And I don't know if there if there's more you can say to that and how that even... Mm -hmm relates to nervous system regulation and like healing it. Mm, yeah. You know, um, us having, having an, an inhibited secure attachment does not just happen when we grew up in homes that, which we'll get to in a minute, the, the other kinds of attachment styles, but homes that were um, egregiously dangerous or violent, you know, are filled with trauma. Um, this also happens when we had loving parents who who showed up for us and were yeah, doing their very mine. best and they and they would give their lives for us and do whatever they could for us and so what can be so confusing when i work with i work with lots of folks who have that experience of feeling 
a lot of shame themselves. Like, how dare I even yeah. look at this? Because my my mother sacrificed her whole life for me. So, you know, and, and everything, you know, I, this is just an example. And, and the thing she desired for me. So how can I possibly look at that she... Uh, parentified me in some ways, meaning I felt responsible for her happiness because look at everything she did. Look how much she loved me. And so what I, what I invite in is that it's not negating any of those things. Yeah. It's instead. And, and when we look at this from a nervous system perspective or polyvagal perspective, we can see that that person or that caregiver, I'm giving the example of a mother, what was really just happening in her nervous system is that she felt unsafe inside from when she was probably a little girl. And then as she grew, you know, no one showed her how to bring regulation to her system. Perhaps no one was able to experience intimacy with her as a child. So how would we change what we don't know how to change when this work is still not normalized in the world? It's not like, you know, I can like go turn on, you know, I don't know, like whatever show I'm trying to think of the shows that I'm like my mother would have been watching, but I can't think of any right now, everybody. I was going to say friends, but that's Coronation my Street was my, yeah. my parents. Uh, yeah, exactly. Were all the shows awful back then? Cause it just feels like it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, don't know. I feel as though they probably were. I don't know. Um, but my, my point is that that we can't change what we don't know, you know, and if this is, this work wasn't being taught. Right. So how could we, have, we, we know we do better when we know better. And so, so first changing our lens and, and look at it. And then with, with compassion, you know, being able to take tolerable steps towards being with not only what was, but what never was, because that's how we make room for what can be. Yeah. So that's being beautiful. With, yeah, we have to be able to be with what never was, which brings up lots of grief and pain, especially if we have parents who love us so much, because what that requires them to look at is the results of what they weren't able to provide. Mm -hmm. And because they love us so much in some people's experiences, the result of that is so painful for them to look at what my my not knowing that this even need to be addressed, look what it did, but it makes room for the what can be. Mm. And so for folks who have parents who are resistant right now, I want you to know their resistance. And this isn't to excuse it, but the resistance is, is often because their, their off system is saying, it is too overwhelming for me to look at that mm. uh, right now. And the more that, as you mentioned, Mark, the working towards that and seeing if there can be a loosening of it and making room for it, the, the experience of not only what was, but what never was, um, really can allow for the processing of now, what can we do about this? And it's never too late. One of my mentors, Peter Levine says, it's never too late to have the childhood we deserve. And I don't just mean That's that with beautiful. our, isn't that beautiful? And I, And what he means by that is not just with our caregivers in the here and now, it means that we have the capacity in a somatic way to go back to these younger parts of ourselves and imprint new experiences and create an internal secure attachment, which allows us also to have a secure attachment with others in the world. I'm curious when you speak to uh, exploring or uncovering the lack uh, or the when we're younger having not had whatever it might be and then we speak to the possibility of what could be and the grieving of what we didn't get uh i sort of get the feeling like without actually acknowledging and grieving what we didn't get which we already actually know existed we just mm -hmm. kind of put it into this compartment in our brain and our hearts and our soul that is never to be sort of looked at um, but I'd imagine that's where the reactivity is. It's kind of this, I think of it like sort of figuratively as this space that protects from exploring that thing. Um, and, and I really wonder, can we really get to what's possible without actually sort of grieving and just acknowledging, uh, what, mm. what wasn't, if that makes mm. sense? Mm. Um, I would say. No, I mean, in, in terms of I, I'm the grieving process can look really different for everyone. Yeah. Grieving, essentially, when I think of in terms of attachment, it means being with 
my embodied experience of what comes up for me when I am able to feel into this autonomic response, which is our nervous system's response to what happened in our childhoods, which we perpetually feel, whether we remember the story of it or not, doesn't matter, our bodies remember, Mm -hmm. Uh, we perpetually relive that attachment, that inhibited attachment, if we had one in our adult lives over and over and over again. And this is why, um, to get back to, to, to explaining attachment theory, because I mentioned this is directly related to our earliest childhood experiences. This is why when arguments happen or disconnections in our adult relationships happen, and you might be saying, I have my own business. I feel good in my life. Like I feel capable, able. I have a mortgage. I drive a car. I take care of my children and animals. But why is it when an argument happens that I feel so out of control in the world, like I'm going to die? And that is because the more I do trauma work and somatic work, the more it's so evident to me that time is absolutely not linear. When we are activated, we're essentially traveling time. We are no longer in the present moment. And now I have a two-year-old or a six-year-old, or it depends on the situation that's coming up, but essentially inhabiting my body. And I am having the same response that I had back then when the attachment was inhibited. Mm -hmm. And so my system, you know, when I'm two years old and there is no adult to be found who can actually see me attune with me and know what's happening in my system, my system does think that I'm going to die. And so this is why when we have a disconnect, yeah, so that intensity, the reason it is so intense is because it was life or death for us. And so truly, because, you know, if, if we consistently did not get those things in our, and we didn't have our autonomic nervous system to come into play, which I'll explain more about in a moment, we wouldn't have been able to make it through. So this is just to, to, I guess I want to, um, to really explain to people, if you have that experience, just know that makes so much sense because our systems, when they're activated and they are seeing threat where there might not actually be threat, uh, essentially what they're doing is bringing us back to that experience and they're thinking that it's happening again, which is relived, uh, traumas relived in our systems or attachment trauma. That's interesting. So it's almost like, I remember a guy explaining that, imagine if time wasn't on a string, but rather a football field all laid out at once that every moment is actually occurring in every moment, which is a bit of mindfuckery. But like, as you explore that, that when you're experiencing this sort of reactivity, that you're kind of straddling two moments, the one where it was created and the one that you're in. Yes. Uh, Wow. Yeah. When you think about that, like the memory was created through the eyes of a two-year-old. So the fear of death or the fear or the anger or whatever it is that feels very toddlerish, um, is so valid through the lens in which it was created. That really is beautiful. Like that makes me emotional to think about how much compassion we can have Mm -hmm. for that reactivity that might be destructive in our current relationships and maybe never really allow us tons of closeness. Um, And maybe we have a hard time actually even tolerating our own toddlers outbreaks because of it, which you were Yes, very very true. Comment happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So, uh, so should we go to um, what are the different attachment styles? And yeah. then Vago, or like, how do you want to? I'd love if it's okay with you to describe them together at the do same it. time you for do each it attachment all. style. Okay. Perfect. So, that sounds like exactly what I was going to do. So perfect. Well, excellent. I'm so glad we're on the same page, Mark. So, so if we're securely attached, like I mentioned, you know, that we got that from our childhoods, our system learns I'm safe in the world and I'm safe with others. And so bringing in our autonomic nervous system, which is what polyvagal theory is all about, our autonomic nervous system is what I call our protective nervous system. On the last episode, I mentioned that I use the analogy of a special ops team because it's the best of the best. It it is the most exquisitely self-protective part of our being. One portion of it's 500 million years old. The other's 300 million years old. That's incredible. So just to give you a sense of its capacity to keep us safe. And that's its primary job. It survived. It survived. Longer than Microsoft. That's beautiful. Longer than mycelium uh, and Microsoft. That's a big thing to think of. Longer than mycelium. 
which I'm is actually, a whole other I'm actually, board. I'm actually not sure exactly on what mycelium, because there might be someone saying, actually, I'm a mycelium expert and I'm, <laughs> it was 600 million years, so I can't be entirely <laughs> sure on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do know. They're both old. Old. No, no, yeah, They're both old. So the, my point in explaining that is this is a this is a um, highly intelligent system within every single mammal. So not just humans, all mammals have the system. And there are four primary states within this autonomic nervous system, really three. We'll go over four, though. So one of those states is called our ventral vagal complex or a state of regulation. And essentially, think about this state as our self-protective circuit gets to rest. It's saying, we don't need to do anything because you're safe right now. So I like to think of it like the self-protective parts are standing at our side instead of standing in front of us. We can walk. We can be free to connect with the world, connect with others. We're in flow. We're, we're not feeling stuck. This is where joy, connection, intimacy, vulnerability, uh, creativity, wonder all live in this state. And one of the predominant reasons for unhappiness that so many of us experience in our lives is because we're not spending enough time there. So if we've had consistent experiences in childhood where relationships were safe, we're going to resource our ventral vagal complex, meaning we are going to hang out in regulation a lot because our systems, especially with people, because our systems are saying connection is safe. And also I can be safe by myself mm. now. And that's our goal. It sounds that's like the spa. the spa. It is just like <laughs> the spa. Yeah, so that we can, and part of part of somatic healing work is to become what one of my colleagues and mentors, Deb Dana, calls the active operator of our nervous systems. Essentially, to go back to the monk thing you said, essentially that means that I'm in the driver's seat of this vehicle. I now spend the predominant amount of my time in my ventral vagal complex regulated. And if the car, if I know the bumps in the roads, to, I know what to expect. And I can do things to make the car have a smoother ride when a bump is coming. And I rarely really go off the road, but if I do, I can bring myself back onto the road. So I'm in control instead of external experiences in my life being in control. That's what's possible when we reshape our nervous systems. So anyway, there's a there's a group of people who got that in their childhood and they're like, I don't need to reshape my nervous system. It was it was shaped well. Now, here's here's where it gets exciting to me for anyone who has felt broken, like something is wrong with you, like you're dysfunctional. I want you to know neuroscience says that is not true. And this is not just me being a nice person, but this is science telling you that. So if in childhood, in my in our earliest childhood experiences, remember, we can't self-regulate. I can't make myself feel better. Now, let's say that I had a caregiver who was on again and off again in their ability to connect with me, attune with me, provide safety and connection. Mm -hmm. Let's say, let's say I had a caregiver who was anxious a lot. They were scared sometimes, meaning they weren't the active operator of their nervous system. They weren't in the driver's seat. Or maybe they were sometimes present with me, but I had a sick sibling who they were distracted with. And so here's what my system says. It says, I'm in trouble because I can't self-regulate. I need that person. But here's the data that I have. They are sometimes around and they are loving. So my system says, what I'm going to do is whatever it takes to keep them close to me. I'm going to do whatever it takes to keep them close because if I can do that, then I will be okay. Hmm. So we are, our, our nervous systems, and then our nervous system comes in and our autonomic nervous system says, you know who will do the trick here? Your sympathetic nervous system. This is the system we want because this is our system of doing stuff. It's our mobilization system. So if you're seeing here, my system is saying, I need to get my caregiver to stay close with me. I have to mobilize to make that happen. I have to have energy in my system. Mm -hmm. So our self-protective system of our, it's our sympathetic nervous system. I like to think of it like them coming to step in front of us. And they're saying, I've got you. I'm going to do whatever it takes to keep them as close as possible. I'm going to make them happy all the time if they're sad because I need them to be happy and regulated because if they're regulated, I will be regulated. I will be okay. So we might find ourselves doing that in, in a role in our family system. We may find ourselves um, 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 having a lot of outbursts because we know that they'll show up if we have a lot of outbursts and many other behavioral responses to get them to stay close to us. And as we develop, so, so first, that's freaking brilliant. That before that I could tie my shoes, before you could write your name, your nervous system could show up for you when the adults around you couldn't. That is so extraordinarily, exquisitely beautiful that our systems can do that. You know, 500 like, million years of brilliance there. 
Yes, 300 actually for 300, our season. 300. <laughs> the next one is five. So, but yeah, it's brilliant. So a uh, couple quick other things about this sympathetic system. So if we're more what's called ambivalently or anxiously attached, we are going to be resourcing our sympathetic nervous system. That's going to be something you know. So if you're familiar with experiences like anxiety, worry, frustration, fear, terror, rage, panic, panic attacks, um, your heart rate increasing, having racing thoughts about how they're going to leave. And I got to make sure that they don't leave. And even though they've been here for 20 years, maybe they'll leave on the 21st year. I don't know. And and they, they, they haven't done anything for me not to be able to trust them, but they might at any moment. So I have to look at their email or I have to look at their phone or I have to keep tabs on them. They're 10 minutes late. What does that mean? That's all a result of you resourcing your sympathetic nervous system because your system learned in your earliest childhood experiences, this is what I need to do to maintain closeness and safety. I have to keep someone close to be okay. Now, when we developed, we got to an age where we were developing our ability to self-regulate, meaning our system was starting to say, yeah, I think I can take up space in the world. I think I can regulate. For many of us, we may have had caregivers because they were anxious in their nervous system. They felt scared. They weren't regulated. A child learns to walk out of the room and the parent says, be careful, you're not going to be okay. Wait for me. You're not okay. Don't fall. So what does that signal to a child? It signals to the child, I am not safe in the world without them. I need that person. And I just want to mention for parents, you know, this doesn't happen over, if you've done this once, of course, this does not create an anxious attachment. This is when this is continually imprinted on our systems. Uh, Experiences like that. It sounds to me like um, I recently consumed uh, Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt which is Mm -hmm. an incredible book. And he talks about that safety as in parenting. Like the world is not safe. You need to be around me and you're not allowed to do anything, uh, which seems to be actually a pretty common sort of experience. Um, So it's interesting you're saying that because I just recently sort of uncovered what are some of the cultural costs of such collective fear is. That's right. And it, it is so important that we are teaching children Um, once they are beginning to develop their ability to self-regulate that they can. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm I'm like, leave the house, but I'm showing them like, you're doing a great job. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere, but I want your nervous system to have the embodied experience that you're capable and able and okay. Mm, That's the key then, hey, is the, the I'm here, but you're free kind of. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Come get me if you need me. I'm right here. And depending on their age, if they're really young, you know, the parents really watching, but not that, that, you know, that term helicopter parent. What (laughs) essentially that means is if I could decode that in a polyvagal way, I would say that parent has a sympathetically evocative nervous system and their system is saying my child and myself are not going to be okay unless we are glued together like this. That's what makes us safe. Does the, does the attunement, like you said, like checking the email or uh, even protecting your child, does that in some way get us regulated again? Like, is that like, do we get rewarded from a physiological yeah. perspective for the like, oh, I read the text and there's no yes. urgency or I read. Yeah. Yeah. So, so essentially when we are in, when we are in dysregulation, our systems think we are either in in danger or we are in life-threatening danger danger that could lead to life-threatening danger or life-threatening danger so this is serious stuff that our nervous system thinks is happening it doesn't actually just think oh that so and so is 20 minutes late and it's probably nothing my system thinks like this is so dangerous this could lead to me dying so this is a big deal so i an analogy i would use is like drowning So our system is essentially saying, I'm drowning. There's no boat around or life preserver. And I do know there is a way that I can come up for air, that I can feel a bit of safety. Now, it might not be lasting, but I'll be able to come up for air. And that might be by checking the email. (gasps) Good, there's nothing in there. Mm. Or I'll call 17 times. And and maybe on the 18th time, they'll, they'll answer. And then they do answer. We come back into connection. And it's almost like, oh, I got a breath of air after almost drowning. And this is why. And here's, here's what a secure attachment looks like. We'll get to the other attachments. But in that analogy, the secure attachment is, I've got a, a raft. I've just been floating on this raft. It's yeah. nice. I've always got this raft. It's, it's a part of me. I could just like 
flip a switch and I become the raft maybe so it's not something separate for me. I mean, I'm just floating along. So when we come into a secure attachment at first, as we're healing, people will will uh, very commonly say, I don't know, the relationship just feels like they're just, they keep being there. They're there, not like in a codependent way, but right. like they're there and they're consistent and they ask me how I feel. And, you know, it's like, they're not going anywhere. And it, it doesn't feel as that drug that I was feeling before or that, that level of excitement. And what happens is, um, fear and excitement both happen are, are, are very, um, uh, flavorings of our sympathetic nervous system. So we can get confused with a, uh, um, uh, what feels exciting and really what is a activated, dysregulated response. So like an unhealthy connection, someone who's not yes. reliable, someone who maybe gaslights us, someone who's dating other people and lies, we yeah. can confuse the fear. Like they're not going to be here for me with excitement. And then, yes. yeah. Cause I've often thought like the arousal itself, especially if we, let's say have sex with them or yes. whatever we might do treats like sort of re-regulates us on some level but really it's so temporary but again you're saying it's the the like coming up for air good kind of air at least it feels good but it feels good for a moment and then we're back to the drowning experience and just a little caveat on that is Mm. um who we pick in our partnerships is directly indicative of how we related to in our earliest childhood experiences until we change that i mean this happens on a subconscious level which is so Fa- I'm mean, fascinating. It's I nuts. I was it's nuts. I was uh, abandoned my by my biological father and neglected by my mother. My stepfather was was dangerous, and so I picked from the time I was 14 until like my late 20s, uh, mid 20s. I would pick everyone I picked. I didn't know about, but they would have another significant other that I would later find out about that they would, of course, leave me for wow. over and over and over. And I didn't know about the other person. I didn't know, um, about that consciously. Um, but why was that happening? Because my system was saying, this is what love is. This is what it looks like. Familiarity. To believe you, you have to try to earn it, but you never will. And you're going to experience Mm -hmm. being, being left over and over and over again, because my system says, this is all that I know that love is. This is all that I know connection is. So I share that just because if folks are listening and they're saying, why, why does this keep happening over and over? Because our systems repeat what they know. And we pick these things on a subconscious level. The good news is healing is the most empowering thing we can do. Because when we do that, we create an internal uh, secure attachment. Meaning that that saying that Peter Levine says, it's never too late to have the childhood we deserve. When I could give myself the young parts what my caregivers were not able to give me, the young parts get a new imprinted experience. And then those young parts of me were no longer drawn to people who were going to replicate my childhood. They were drawn to people who uh, who were like me, adult me, meaning who were like what I had given them. Mm. So so that can actually happen. I, I happen. I like to demystify it because because it can be so um, I don't know intangible in terms of how do we actually do that. Um, but it's I know I went on a little tangent, but I think maybe some of that's important for some folks really to hear. Is. Um, in terms of why we're drawn to who we're drawn to. And then that can actually change too. That's so powerful. Like I think of a period of time that I spent very drawn to unavailable people and like really good. I mean, they were good people, but the really good women I ran from, like if I knew that I, they were like reliable and, you know, not just out of a relationship or you know, not yeah. potentially dating other people. I was like, ah, eh, you know, like th- there's not a connection or I feel if, and I've been watching, have you watched, and I say this uh, with trepidation for uh, judgment upon me. Have you watched uh, <laughs> Love is Blind too? The second season? No. Okay. It's pretty incredible. I got to say, observing these people who are talking behind a screen Like a Uh a screen between their two rooms. And so they really are falling in love without any physical understanding Mm -hmm. what the other person looks like. And what was really fascinating is there's one guy who at first I was like, this guy's not a great, he doesn't appear to be a fantastic person based on what Mm -hmm. he's saying. And then he has this huge turnaround where he like recognizes his materialism and his, um, 
sort of like obsession with the looks, the possible looks or weight of the women he's talking to. And you see him soften with this awareness. And then in the last episode, uh, you can see him now in person with this woman. Mm -hmm. She's beautiful. And he, you can see him being like, eh, I'm not attracted to her. I'm not. And you actually can watch this in real time of him feeling. And I so relate to his yes. experience because I remember wanting so badly a connection and then getting it and then being like, there's just like, it was, I didn't recognize then that my nervous system was overwhelmed by the closeness and That's I needed right. to run. That's right. It's something important to understand as we're healing that, that, um, good experiences have a, have a lot of energy involved with them. So being vulnerable, for example, or being intimate or seen require there, or, or rather, um, are accompanied by a lot of somatic energy in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And if our systems aren't used to those things, it can, the good things will actually feel overwhelming for us at first. So much so that our systems are like, I got to get this away because it's just too much. And then our cognitive part of us are like, what the hell? I want that thing. Why am I doing this? Because our systems don't know it yet. So it also requires being able to tolerate the good things in our, in our relationships that they won't feel good at first. That's so wild. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I, to think that, and I think for you listening, like it, it's it's interesting that we will not let ourselves win or let ourselves because like the healing that has to occur, the acceptance of what wasn't. And, you know, I, I feel like so much of my experience was from adult relationships that had betrayal that created this mm -hmm. new unconscious yes. fear. And when I finally like discovered regulation and reliability and stopped interacting with the opposite sex for a while so that I could deal with what was going on, um, and heal, it was like, then I had no tolerance for ambivalence. Like I was like, yeah. no, like if you're unavailable by, like, I'm not available to unavailability anymore. It's unattractive. That's right. Don't get me wrong. I was still aroused by it, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. And that's the beauty that happens. You see this self-protective circuit we have, here's what it has this database that I mentioned in the last episode of past, all of our past information. So it looks to this database to decide what to think of the current relationship that I'm confronted with or in. And so think of your romantic partnerships. Think about this for a second. They usually become our person. Uh, it can tend to feel like family. Maybe we even cohabitate with them. Uh, we do daily things together that you would do with family. So guess what our threat detector does? It says, what does this remind me of? It looks to the database and says, oh, this reminds me of what it was like with those caregivers or with that past relationship. And what, what happened there? Oh, definitely don't let them too close or definitely always be happy because if you are ever angry at them, they pull away and shut down and that feels very dangerous. Uh -huh. So our systems then say in, in a millisecond, it says, I know what this is based on the past, even if it is different and says, based on the past, what we needed to do to make, maintain safety to get you here alive was this. So we are going to do the same game plan now. And then we find ourselves showing up relationally the same way that we did in the past based on what, based on the evidence that we have from past experience. So part of our work is giving ourselves disconfirming experiences, meaning we need to fill this bucket or this database with new experiences of safe connection. I love that disconfirming experiences, but how brilliant a system of associative um, data, you know, like. I forget what the data is on how much, what the data is on how much data the unconscious mind can process, but it's like insane the amount of information it's bringing in, but like beautifully canceling it out of our lived experience so that we don't have to, you know, so we can process other things. But what you're saying is like, I think for you listening, like I, my mind is being blown just with how relationally all those things are going on. And then we often wonder, why do I want love? Why do I want safe connection? Why do I want to be better at this? And yet I just can't seem to. Mm -hmm. I think what's so beautiful about it is a part of our systems never give up. You know, our truest self parts 
no matter what, you know, they're, they're saying, but I think it's possible. Right. And I'm going to go at that again that's to love, try to make right? it, that's you know, allure. yeah. And, and, and that's right. And there are things that we, we can do. So maybe going through just the other two and, and how attachment styles, how they relate to polyvagal theory and then some tools I can, that sounds impart. great. So the, the other uh, attachment style is called uh, avoidant, and, or this is another one. So remember when we're born, again, we can't self-regulate, so we're in trouble. And if we had caregivers who were neglectful, they weren't there, or they were dangerous um, for to us, our system says, wow, I'm in trouble. The other one was they're sometimes there and sometimes not. Maybe I can get them to stay here more. This is, they're not here or they're, or they're not okay for me. So our brilliant systems say, our autonomic nervous systems say, this is so life-threateningly dangerous for you because we can't continue on if we are in acute dysregulation all the time. We wouldn't be able to develop. So our systems say, and that's heightened sympathetic terror. So our systems say, we're going to call upon what's called our dorsal vagal complex. This is the 500 million year old, most extreme form of self-protection. And what happens is it cloaks us in this ex- kind of like a numbing potion where I don't have to feel the perpetuating, excruciating terror that I, that is in my body of not being able to regulate myself mm. and not having my needs met of safety, connection, um, attunement, et cetera. And so even when those things are unavailable, our systems can fortify and shut down in the state of immobilization. So this doesn't mean that the activation, that the terror, it wasn't there. It means that the terror is still the, is there, but my systems say, I'm going to cover it up and numb it so you don't have to perpetually feel that which is so beautiful that our systems have the capacity to when humans have let us down or they haven't been there for us, our autonomic nervous systems have never let us down. They are the most secure attachment. I think it's the first time I thought about this, but to us, they are so. (laughs) Isn't that true? They're always here for us. Always here for us. So, and they can protect for decades. So as a result, here's what this looks like. It is, and, and, and in the book attached, I just want to name, there is a lot, of, maybe I say this as a former avoided too, just want to mention that, but there's a lot of so much negative um, yeah. um, talk out there about being avoidant. I, like I they the don't give one. a shit. Like, like good they luck don't to them. Yeah. So here's what's actually happening in someone's system who is avoidant. Uh, we have a primal human need for connection. It is inherent in our species. So we are dealing with, if we're avoidant, we're dealing with two equal and opposite forces at the same exact time. An internal biological force that is saying, I need connection because it's a part of our species with our autonomic nervous system saying, but it's so dangerous, you might die. So I'm going to inhibit it. Mm. So people who are avoidant, they don't enjoy that. They are feeling extraordinarily lonely, totally disconnected. The experience is like, is I want connection, but I can't make it happen. I'm so lonely or alone in the world, but it's like there's an invisible wall that won't let me get close to other people. So what this looks like in our relational dynamics is when, you know, someone says, there's some simple examples. When someone says, hey, tell me about your day. We say, oh, it's fine. How's yours? Because your system is saying, why would I tell you about my day? I already know what it was like. I'm used to fortifying (laughs) and going to an island and doing it alone. It feels like I would be recapitulating that because I don't know how to receive help because I never was helped. (laughs) That's probably so familiar to so many people. It kind of feels similar of like, hey, uh, you know, I I think of like sometimes when Kai asks me about my day and then I'm like, yeah, I mean, do we have to talk about it? Like, yeah, it's like this beautiful bid of connection and curiosity. Like, it's so it's so interesting that. That's feeling, right. I think of like feelings too, when someone wants yeah. to talk about feelings and you're like, ah, like do we yeah. have to talk about feelings? Exactly. So this is the result of, remember, our system, that's evidence that your autonomic nervous system is saying, we don't know how to do that. Or that feels uncomfortable or scary. That would require me coming off of this island that I have learned mm-hmm. how to be on and there's safety in this island. And so, you know, there's levels of, of these attachments that we might have in terms of the intensity or, or, and by the way, we can be a combination too. But in terms of this avoidant one, I'm going to hang out in my dorsal vagal complex a lot. That means that 
I might experience apathy often. I might feel, you know, hopeless a lot or shut down. Or when people ask, what do I feel? I'm like, I don't know. How do you know what you feel? Or someone says, what do you notice in your body? You're like, what does it mean to have a body? I don't know. Uh, when, <laughs> when a rupture occurs or an argument, here's what your system is saying. Remember, we have the database of past information. If we had caregivers who are neglectful or dangerous and a rupture happens, our system is saying that's life-threateningly dangerous. So when an argument happens, our system, our dorsal vagal complex takes over and all of a sudden we shut down. We feel nothing. We have to remove ourselves, like get away. Our systems are pulling back. Like, I can't talk about this. It's too much. I have to go. I have to get away from you. Or I just go blank. I can't think about it at all. And the person keeps saying like, well, let's find a time to talk. And I'm like, ah, in three years, like I, I can't. But but what I'm embodying is, or what I want, to, want viewers to, or listeners to see is this is in our body. It's not just what we're thinking. It's that somatic experience, meaning your dorsal system is saying, go to your island. It's the only place you're safe. So, which is a brilliant adaptive strategy that we learn again, before we can even tie our shoes. And then. No, go on. There's just one more real quick. The last one is the disorganized attachment. So this is the result of our caregivers being on again and uh, our, rather our caregivers sometimes being a source of safety, sometimes being a source of danger. Mm. So, you know, I had a caregiver who was sometimes really nice to me and then sexually abused me. So how confusing for my system. And, and yeah. they were the only person nice to me in my childhood. So I needed that niceness to survive. Coupled with, whoa, they're extraordinarily dangerous. So I give that example that that's just one kind of experience that can create a disorganized attachment. Or maybe my parent was sometimes really nice and then they lost complete control of their nervous system and they would scream at me or berate me. Or they, they gave dub, um, unwinnable experiences for me like, hey, go do that thing. And then when I did the thing, they would say, wow, you don't care about me. I can't believe you went to hang out with your friends. Um, so they were sometimes safe, sometimes dangerous. We don't know what to expect. So our nervous systems are going to resource something called freeze. Mm. Freeze is, you think of that like deer in headlights, it's tonic immobility. It's equal parts sympathetic. So half of team sympathetic shows up energy with half of team dorsal that's shutting down. And there's a lot of shame around this response because it's literally two equal and opposite forces. I'm sure there's people here who experience this, you know, think about for, you know, anyone starting a business, for example, you sit down at your computer, you're like, there's so much to do. What do I do? Holy shit. There's 75 tasks today. I have to do it now because everyone else in life is ahead of me. And then your system says, but I can't do it. There's too much. No, but I have to, but I can't, but I have to, but I can't, but I have to, but I can't. Right. And four hours go by and you haven't actually accomplished anything, but you're so exhausted from what's happening inside. That's freeze. Or like, I need to have the conversation with them. No, I can't. They're going to leave. But I have to, but I can't. I have to. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, what's happening? And you're like, I don't know. But you don't actually communicate the thing. So that's freeze. I feel, freeze is I feel something like people that, spend decades in that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Freeze and, is a very common protective state. And it's a common one that we experience when we're disorganized. And so when there's, you know, someone's upset, we just might go into freeze. We can't even respond. Or we may also notice if you're disorganized, we want people close. So when they get, they, we want them close because sometimes they were nice. But our when they get close, our self-protective system says, get away from me. And so this could be in a partnership, you're experiencing closeness and having a nice dinner and laughing and there's, oh, there's connection happening there. And then all of a sudden your protective system says, what do we know about this? They might harm you based on your past experience. Mm -hmm. And then what I would do is out of nowhere, the self-protective system would come online and say, you remember that thing you did last year? That was so freaking rude. I'm so mad at you about it. I'm still mad at you. Wow. I didn't realize I was, but I am. And they're like, what? We were just connecting. Yeah. And, and then later you might feel like, I know, where did that come from? That was the protective part saying, get away from me. So there's this, there's two things happening at the same time. Come close, go away. Come close, go away, which our nervous systems are running the show. And by the way, in any of those attachments that I just mentioned, whether we're anxiously attached, avoidant, or disorganized, it's like our, our autonomic nervous system hijacks our being. Not to harm us, but to help us. Right. It's saying, this is dangerous. Here's the MO, or here's what helped me in childhood or in those past experiences. And I'm going to use this now. 
And then we kind of time travel, like I mentioned, we might feel out of control, young, scared. And then later, when we're in disright, when we're regulated, we may look back and be like, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. I felt like a totally different person. Oh. Yeah, because you were a totally different person and you weren't in the driver's seat. That's so interesting. I think, I mean, I want to speak for everyone listening to be like, fuck, wow, like mind bogglingly blown in terms of, oh, wow, I feel witnessed. I feel validated. Mm -hmm. I feel compassion now for these parts of me that that's where it came from. Because I think we often hate those parts of ourselves, like hate that yeah. I can't be close, hate that I push away and I get close. And then I just, why can't I love someone well? And what you said about the book Attached, I had a similar experience that it's kind of like, and I have both been anxious and avoidant. So I was kind of like, well, it's kind of like you're on your own, buddy. Like <laughs> avoidance side, like you better learn how to increase your capacity for closeness, but not really any um, compassion for where it comes from because ultimately how our attachment system and nervous system codes is just differently according to circumstances. But can a nervous system be anxious or um, disassociated, is that the, or sorry, disorganized. Uh, disorganized. Can it be it, from similar circumstances, we could just, our response could be one or the other, maybe based on how our parents' nervous system was. Is that fair? Yes. So I would say that for, first of all, all of us are usually a culmination of multiple attachments. Oh, that's good. Some, that we're like, some people listening might be like, oh, I'm all of those. Um, that's because we have a pro predominant um, person we attach to, but there's also other people around. You know, there were other people in the mix. Um, and then in our adult lives, we may have had some, some things happen in our relational dynamics. So we may notice that with certain people, one part of our attachment comes up more. Like if someone was, when I was so avoidant, if someone was more avoidant than I was, then it would turn on the anxious, anxious or disorganized part of me to get them close. So you may notice different parts showing up of your, uh, of, of your attachment styles, um, dependent on the person that you are with. Um, I think that's important to name too. And the beautiful thing is the more that we are able to give the parts of ourselves, what they didn't get based on what I've mentioned here today, the more we give ourselves that, for example, um, if I'm, Actually, I'll finish the sentence and then just say some examples. But if we give ourselves that, it reshapes our nervous system, meaning our nervous systems are malleable. And instead of being anxious all the time, we can actually reshape them so that we get to experience that ventral place of regulation more. Or instead of being shut down or frozen, we can actually reshape these systems. They're, they're pliable like clay Beautiful. so that we are spending more time in regulation. And when we do that, our relationships become easier too. And it means taking tolerable steps. Um, when I say a tolerable step, I, I think there's two things that makes a step tolerable. One is it does not feel good. And the second thing is we can complete it. We can complete reason, it. Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. We can, I can complete the step. It doesn't feel good. Why does it not feel good? It doesn't feel good because my autonomic nervous system is coming online. So it's getting activated and saying, I don't know if this step is safe. But this is how we give ourselves disconfirming experiences, that the step is small enough that this, our autonomic nervous system, it comes online. So I feel anxious that I'm going to do this, but it's like, it's not fully stopping me because the step is, step is small enough that the sympathetic system says, all right, I'm right here if you need me, but, but I'll, I think I'll let you take the step. And then we complete the step when we're exhausted. Yes. Disconfirming yes. experience. <laughs> I just experienced closeness. It gets stored in the database. So we want to start tape it taking. If we are anxiously attached, that means I want to start taking tolerable steps towards, can I experience self-regulation? Mm. Meaning, can I go on that walk by myself? And can I experience, most of it will probably feel shitty because my system is saying, I want to be with the other person. But can I notice maybe the beautiful tree or if you're lucky, the owl you see or whatever, and take in just one piece of goodness around that? So can I build my capacity for self-regulation and doing therapeutic somatic tools to build your capacity for it? And then also, can I build my capacity for, a? this is very important, attuned co-regulation, which is different from survival connection. Same one. Survival connection is like, 
is the, um, uh, where are you? Come home. I need you close. Or yeah. I call a friend to, to rant at them. So I'm not actually connecting. I'm saying I feel so dysregulated, but I not need another living being to be with me to feel okay. But attuned co-regulation might be something as simple as, let's say you're sitting down to dinner with your loved one or something and really taking a breath and taking a moment and take in their eyes and their face, because this is where our ventral vagal complex lives in our face. And just see what it's like to notice kind eyes looking at you. Mm. Can I take in just for a moment, kind eyes that are right here with me? That's attuned co-regulation. Wow. Does that make sense? The differing between yeah. the, the, I need you close to feel safe because I'm not okay alone versus I'm going to actually be here with you, which is the disconfirming experience. Many of us had parents who couldn't actually just really be. See us. Yeah. That's so, yeah. When I think about that edge, one feels like a choice and the other one doesn't. Yeah. Yes. Right. So beautiful. Like to, to, so you're saying whatever I needed didn't get the more I give that to myself, the more capacity I'm basically modeling. I'm co-regulating myself, you know, in some way, like two parts of me are co-regulating. I call it internal co-regulation. I actually oh, ran great. by them. I was like, yeah, run this by Steve Porges. That's what I call it. Yeah. Because that's what it is. We're internal. It's it really so is. It's like the adult self with the young self. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's oh, so beautiful that we is. can do that. And and you yeah. can do it just in a moment, like on a walk. You can just sit. That's and right. Do it. Wow. I wonder. If, what is it um, like? Have you ever had someone do it in the mirror, like co-regulate their mm. eyes? I wonder if that would. Yeah, I, I. For some people, that can feel too too. There's too much um, uh, charge that happens there in their bodies. Mm -hmm. But that absolutely can be something that that I invite folks to explore. What we want it essentially, if we are more anxiously attached it is going to be harder for us to self-regulate. Yeah. So we want to build our capacity for self-regulation, but also I see this missed a lot with attachment. We have to build our capacity for attuned co-regulation. So if I'm feeling feeling upset in a moment, can I really take in the person holding my hand? Just, just sit, not need to act, yeah. just like sit That's together right. and hold the pain, hold the whatever. Let their nervous system affect yours. Let their nervous system bring bring regulation to yours, which is what co-regulation is. And if we're more avoidant, the tolerable step for us is it's going to feel much safer to self-regulate. But I would say that we aren't just like with anxiously attached, we're not actually co-regulating. It's a survival co-regulation. If we're more avoidant, we might say, no, I'm good at self-regulation. But really what we're doing is <laughs> numbing. Yeah. Dumb. So what we want to do is, no, can I be exquisitely present to my body? And to the experience of joy and pleasure by myself, whatever that looks like that resonates as good for me, can I really be present to that instead of numbing out? And then can I step off my island in a tolerable way as a, as a, <laughs> a well, someone who was so avoided that part of me that was like, I want connection with others. I would like make plans with, I'm going to show you what a tolerable step might look like. I would make plans with someone because I was so wanting connection. And then the day that I was supposed to be hanging out with them, I would feel this deep dread and would say like, I'd rather go clean the toilet than go out to dinner with this person. And I was so confused because I'm like, but I like this person and I want connection. Why is this happening? That's because my dorsal system was saying, but you're not safe to connect with others. Mm. So what does the tolerable step look like? Now it might reach a place where the going out to going on a hike or to dinner is tolerable. And what, what you can expect is in it being tolerable is you'll feel activated during it. You'll feel like I'm pushing myself. This feels hard and exhausting. And then at dinner, there's like a laugh that happens. You're like, oh yeah, that was nice to hear about their story. I talked about my story for four seconds, but like, that's a better thing that I used to do zero seconds. And then you come home and then you need to not be around anyone, but your animals for three days. Great. Tolerable staff. <laughs> you did it. So that's what, that's what it looks like. We want to, we want to begin building our capacity for those tolerable steps. If we're avoidant, it's going to be way harder to, to co-regulate. We want to work on that and then embodied self-regulation. And then if we're disorganized, we might notice that both feel challenging. Probably co-regulation feels more challenging, um, but we want to begin building our capacity to step towards calmness. I can, and, and one more thing on that, 
We want to let people close and then choose when we create distance. Mm. So let's say that's me. I let people get close. I push them away. If I notice that, that I'm with my partner and we're experiencing closeness, that instead of my nervous system taking over the steering wheel, I would want to clue in for my partner. Hey, this is the pattern that happens. And I might say in that moment, can we, uh, can we stop talking about this for just a second? It felt like a lot and, and we'll come back to it. So that's me being in the driver's seat instead of my nervous system taking over. Mm. Does that like, make sense? And like you're like creating space for it. That's right. Yeah. But choosing so, the the level of closeness. But also what I love about that is that heals the other person's fear of distance by saying, I'll be back right. though. Like we're coming back. That's, Just give me a second. That's exactly right. If, a, if an argument or a rupture occurs, the avoidant person's job is to say when they're going to come back. And do it. So we won't. Mm -hmm. And do it. We don't want to have the expectation of a step that's not tolerable, meaning to stay. If we override our nervous systems and just say, fine, I'll stay here. <laughs> all you're going to do is shut down. You're not you even there. Yeah. You can't even have a conversation. So you, they actually need to go away. But the more we can understand our partner and say, this is not because they don't care about me. This is happening because their protective system has a lot of evidence that people aren't safe and these kind of experiences aren't safe. So they need to go self-regulate so they can come back. And it's their job to learn how to say, let's reconvene in a half hour or an hour. And they come and they come back. And if I'm anxiously attached, my job is to tolerate space. That's the self-regulating piece. To like regulate and as, I, they, as you give them that space. That's exactly right. Which is not just for them, everybody. Right. That's the gift for you because your work, your work is to learn to self-regulate because the beautiful thing is when we do this, as someone who is so avoidant that I literally wouldn't call people back for years, I have no connection to like basically any humans. I'm not even kidding you. Oh, wow. That I really want people to know that it is so possible to heal this and change this. And we need yes. the somatic work because this is somatic. This is somatic simply means it's, it's happening here. in our bodies. Yeah. No, nope, it's just think about how you feel when a fight happens, what happens in your body. And you're like, bye. And <laughs> yeah. That tells you what happens in your body tells you the story of your attachment. Mm. It's nice to read books, but it's really the story is held in your body. However, you're responding tells me the story of your attachment and it tells you the story and we can make the story different. And that's what, that's what somatic attachment work is. It's so beautiful. It's such like it, it is all just possibility, you know, not just possibility, but also acknowledgement, validation, healing, and then like stop chasing other people for the shit you got to give to yourself because you're never going to get it there. That's the whole design of trying to outsource yes. it. Um, That's right. I have a couple of thoughts. One, I find that often in sort of the language and literature, because a, a common conversation about attachment, you're right, is more like anxious people are like, they're the victims of relational experiences. Yeah. And I don't want to dismiss that. Obviously, mm -hmm. that is sometimes true. Um, but so much of the, I, I feel like psychologically, it would be easy to settle into the victim mode as the anxious person, especially when so much literature sort of demonizes the avoidant. Uh, especially when I think a lot of, of my experience of conversations about avoidant tendencies is they're often labeled as narcissistic, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which... I really do feel like extreme avoidance is narcissism, like mm -hmm. far, far, far spectrum end. Um, but I'm curious your thoughts on that because like I feel like often the anxious person feels kind of fucked over. Mm -hmm. And yet in my experiencing of being avoidant, when I was avoidant, I did present as having high self-confidence. I yeah. really participated more in short-term relationships because that was... I could control the depth of connection and intimacy. Mm -hmm. And I also sort of saw, like I remember this one woman I was dating when I was in my late twenties, just after my engagement ended where I was not available to relationship. What was I doing dating? Um, <laughs> and she was so incredible. And I remember she said to me, I'm really starting to like you. And I was like, Oh God. And like my stomach got sick. Yeah. I remember exactly where I was laying. And, um, I pretty much ghosted her after that, which I have since repaired. <laughs> However, I really feel like also ghosting seems to be quite more associated with like uh, the avoidant 
side of things. So I'm curious, yeah. one on your thoughts of sort of the hierarchical structure that we create and the different attachments and then mm. maybe how ghosting shows up. Mm. Well, I think they all can have a negative connotation. For example, the the negative connotation I often hear with someone who's anxiously attached is you're needy. Oh, yeah, that's uh, very true. That's maybe one of the most common. We definitely do that for you're too much, you're needy. You're, you're too much, much and you're needy. And your avoidance is you don't give a shit about people and maybe you're narcissistic or something. Um, so so neither of those things are actually true. Right. If, if we can actually start to see, I, I so very much wish that when we are traveling time, every time, by the way, anytime your reaction doesn't match the circumstance, yeah. meaning what's showing up in my system right now doesn't actually match the current situation that I have in my life. That is a clue that I have time traveled, meaning my system thinks that what happened in the past is happening again. So I'm essentially back there. Right. And if we could start seeing in terms of attachment, if we can start seeing, and again, this is not to excuse abusive behavior, egregious behavior, but simply to have an understanding of what's happening. If I can start to see that, oh, when I identify as female, when I uh, would get a rupture would happen, I would become this tiny little scared, completely terrified little girl. And I would go hide under my bed. And so it didn't matter if I was in my 20s or if I was three, I was going to hide under my bed because people were so dangerous or disappear from my body altogether. And so what we what we do as humans is we take people at face value as this is what you look like now. You're showing up as an adult in the world. But how often are people not actually showing up as an adult all the time? <laughs> all the time, younger parts are running the show. And so if we can just start seeing it differently, like, oh, that asshole person who like ghosted me. And again, I'm not excusing that behavior, but if we can start having compassion for ourselves, starting with ourselves or that's no one enjoys doing that. You know, why, why are they doing that? Because their system is saying people are so dangerous and so unsafe. Intimacy is so dangerous and so unsafe. Love is so dangerous and so unsafe. I lost it once and I thought I was going to die. So I'm not going to let myself love another person ever again. And the protective parts are deciding this for us. Mm. And that's really what's happening when we are more avoidantly attached. That That is going against human biology, meaning our systems are wanting attachment. Right. So I just want people what to know happens. that that person is suffering a lot. They're not enjoying that experience. They're suffering a lot because they have a biological need for connection, yet they're pulling away from it. So, and, and, and I can say personally that that was my experience for so long. I was, and then I had so much shame around it. Like right. why can't even friends, I would love someone's childhood friends that I knew for 20 years, they would keep, they kept showing up. They're like, we don't care if you go away. We love you. They knew about my trauma history and they're like, it's okay. We're here. And because they loved me so much, I couldn't step towards them. It was like an invisible wall was there. And I was so mean to myself, was like so unkind. And I just want folks to know if that's your experience and that's happening for you to you, it's not happening to harm you. It's happening for you because your system doesn't know those things are safe. Mm -hmm. yet. And if someone's anxiously attached and their people are calling them needy, that's not true either. Right. There's a brilliant resourceful young part that is saying with your with your autonomic nervous system i am not going to give up on having the connection so that i don't die that's what your system's really doing and so if we stop taking people at face value meaning what they look like in their numerical age when we start understanding our autonomic nervous systems our parts and what's actually happening in our relationships it i think it can change everything because it's the starting point of wow, now I see this is not happening to me. It's happening for me. And if it's happening for me, how do I talk to these protective parts to show them that life can be different now? Mm. I mean, it feels like that kind of work can completely change the world, you know, that Yeah. I know Frances Weller said that uh, we live in an adolescent culture, you know, that we are collectively not adults. Like we don't live in initiated That's communities right. where we've done this sort of regulation. I'd say like, our news completely dysregulates us. Our, you know, oh yeah, 
the way that we all of these systems though are built on dysregulation. You know, politics, what is that really built on? A lot of people with entirely That's dysregulated nervous systems. Like marketing and, itself sort of appeals to often numbing the space of dysregulation. Like think yeah, of like right. one click purchase culture or like alcohol or whatever it might be. Like we yeah. That's so interesting. Like when you think about it. Our whole culture is built on uh, coping strategies. So right. there's a difference between coping strategies and regulating resources. Regulating resources are things that talk to my autonomic nervous system and say, hey, we're safe. And it says, oh, yeah, we're safe. And then we feel good. Now, coping strategies are anything that helps numb the activation that we don't know what to do with. Our world is a world that is has activation that we don't know what to do with. There are people, a lot of you know, billions of people in the world that have no idea because this work is still not normal. You know, I hope it becomes as normal as Netflix. And I don't know there anything it is. about football, but like it people is. who like football, whatever. Uh, but norm, you know, normalized. This is what people are doing instead of just, you know, looking at TikTok. I don't know. I don't, I'm so, I'm dating myself so much that I'm saying that. But you get my point that if we can normalize this and instead of, coping. And there's nothing, I would say coping strategies, how great that we found them when we had nothing else. Like yes. incessantly, like Beautiful. scrolling Instagram, sex, picking, cutting. I've done all of these, um, alcohol, drugs, working all the time, um, yeah. watching television, assessing incessantly, all of those things are coping strategies. And essentially that what that means is it helps you not have to feel what's happening in your body. Mm. And our whole world is built on that. How do I not feel what's happening in my body? And the more we can decrease attention span, what we're really doing is helping people to not be in their body more and more. And the work is, how do we change what's happening in our body so it's a peaceful home that I can actually inhabit? That's what healing brings. What a beautiful thing that technology can bring this information to someone so they can choose their relationship to technology. And I say that that's how i feel about it too yeah you know because like without technology you and i wouldn't have met so many of that's right i guess that oh there's so many it, i i and i say that as someone who you know i i think it's uh the beautiful thing about technology that i love so much is that i can reach people who are in parts of the world who wouldn't have resources right you know and, and that i feel so grateful for what a beautiful gift it is but like every wonderful thing right. there's always two sides of it you know and and just speaking to that other part of it that we want to be careful of for each of us. Well, if not regulated, we want to extract everything we can, you know, and yeah. not dissimilar again to how we treat the planet often. Um, yeah. Sarah, always an incredible pleasure. I'm sure that those of you listening have had your minds, souls, hearts blown wide open in such a good way. Um, and I think we all have beautiful, not even work to do, but like effort to put in, to be present, to learn all these wonderful things and, and integrate them in our lives. And, you know, this should be mainstream. So make sure you share this, everybody, everywhere. <laughs> Sarah, where can people find more of you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Sarah B coaching uh, or Sarah Baldwin coaching.com. Perfect. And we'll make sure we put those links in the show notes. And Sarah, so much gratitude. Thank you for being, for coming back on the show. Oh, thank you so much, Mark, for the work you put out into the world, for this podcast, for having me on it. I'm really grateful for you. Much love. Much love.